Kalispera sas, ke kalasoriza te, bonsoir bienvenu, good evening and welcome. My name is Jonathan Tomlinson, I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute, and I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Charles Sturge. Charles holds a BA in Classics from the University of Cambridge, and he stayed on at King's College for his MPhil, also in Classics, with a thesis entitled Intersite Relations and Political Structure of the Plain of Argos in the Late Bronze Age, the hegemony of Mycenae in the 13th century BC. He's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Cincinnati with a thesis entitled From Pots to People, Commensal Practices of the Late Bronze Age Aegean in Comparative Perspective. Charles has carried out archeological fieldwork in the UK and Croatia and in many parts of Greece, Corinth, the Cycladic Islands, the Palace of Nestor, Knossos, Petras, and at the Canadian Institute's project at Havania. This evening, he will speak to us on metrical structures in prehistoric Cretan tablewares, a case study from Knossos. Charles. Good evening. Um, my apologies for my late arrival and um, my apologies for this PowerPoint because about an hour ago I was already to take a taxi only to find that my PowerPoint had vanished. So it is, I think, everyone's worst nightmare. Anyhow, if people are willing to persevere with me, I shall also persevere and make the best of what I can do with this, whatever we're going to call it, semblance of a presentation. I hope at the very least I will be able to get my key points over. Oh, hold me one moment. It's been a stressful afternoon. Prehistoric Cretan tablewares have been intensively studied for over a century. However, the prime aim of such studies has been chronology, typology, and the study of imports and exports. Less studied has been the trace element of human behavior encoded by the pots themselves. Fundamentally, pots are tools, functional tools with specific purposes ranging from the obvious role as a container for substances to the less obvious in the way in which they act as social signals and cues. Yet the most frequently encountered material, yet as the most frequently encountered material type from most excavations, vast repositories of pottery moulder in our museums and great catalogues of material have been published, but are rarely used to their full potential. In short, I suggest that there is more for us to do, especially with regard to analysing the behaviour and choices of ceramic consumers. Consequently, for my broader dissertation project, I have aimed to develop a hybrid qualitative quantitative methodology by which we can study such published material, legacy data, and in future, perhaps fresh material too. <clears throat> me. We cannot claim to ever know the function of each individual pot. However, I believe, as others have before, that close focus on the attributes of ceramic sequences can indirectly highlight moments of change, which may be potentially linked to broader social developments identified within the Aegean. Tonight, if I'd had a full PowerPoint, I would have liked to present a case study of this methodology in action. Analysis of the fine tablewares of late Neopalatial Krasos, the late Minoan I period. For reasons of time, I will be focusing predominantly on the plain and decorated pottery and only open shapes. Over the course of this lecture, I want to propose three specific points about late Minoan I tablewares at Krasos. One, that there is a sufficient difference between the plain and decorated pottery as to imply that these were created with completely different behaviours in mind 
and are not simply the cheap and expensive version of essentially the same thing. <coughs> A pattern which holds throughout the neopalatial period. Tentatively, I will suggest that these quotidian pots may be instead be represented by the monochrome and what I term light decorated material. But the present published evidence is too weak to be certain. Point number two, that a significant shift in consumer demand, underly in consumer demand underlying behavior and thus etiquette with regard to decorated pottery can be observed between late Minoan 1A and late Minoan 1B. And point three, uh, alongside this, we can qualitatively de detect a degree of experimentalism in late Minoan 1B pottery. Combined, the latter points indicate that some degree of social change is already in progress within late Minoan 1B, suggesting that the new social dynamics of late Minoan 2 do not appear fully ab novo. More broadly, however, especially when speaking to a generalist audience, we might ask why does an in-depth study of Cretan tableware's matter to us? Well, it matters because of what is at the heart of this research is human choice, behavior, and social dynamics. I do not claim that such research can elucidate fully the demands of prehistoric humans, but I hope by the end of this evening, this notwithstanding, to have convinced you that such a methodological approach, which is accessible to all periods, all ceramics, can indirectly reveal moments of change, of choices made and paths taken, and that in so doing, we can advance not just our knowledge of Cretan prehistoric tablewares, but also Cretan prehistoric humans. <sighs> to do this, lofty aim, I shall take the following steps. Describe the synthetic data set on which this project is based, a qualitative and quantitative analysis of all published pottery from Knossos. In addition, it will be necessary to discuss some of the methodological and theoretical problems associated with creating such a synthetic data set from over 100 years of published data. As I have already said, I have limited myself tonight to an in-depth study of only the decorated and plain open vessels, rather than the entire range of cooking, serving and consumption pottery. Next, we will describe the analytical variables, both quantitative and qualitative. My position is that even if direct functional reconstruction is not possible, the inherent affordances of pottery, its characteristic, its size, its morphology, capacity, are still trace elements of human consumer choices and behavior. Next, I want to apply this method to an analysis of the late Minoan 1A pottery at Knossos before moving to late Minoan 1B to explore what continuity and change might be seen. Finally, I offer some conclusions on the basis of both sets of analysis with regard to the commensal behaviours of the late Minoan 1 period at Knossos, and to contextualise them in the wider picture of prehistoric Crete. I suggest there exists a clear metrical hierarchy within Knossian pottery, which maps also to production quality. So let's move to our data set. In this section, I will review the data gathered and the solution to some of the obvious problems confronting a proposed synthetic analysis those relating to discard, context, publicatory bias, and stylistic dating. While these problems are not entirely avoidable, I propose that the blended qualitative quantitative method adopted by this study, combined with a deliberately low analytical resolution and tonight a low analytical PowerPoint, mitigates their effects. Three levels of data collection underpin my study, two databases, and a final qualitative sweep of information. To the best of my knowledge, I have surveyed every single publication of Knossian pottery from Evans's time to most recently Emilia Oddo's publication of the House of the Frescoes last year. The principal qualitative aim was to build a picture of the range of ceramics in use in each period of the neopalatial to final palatial periods. Depending on the level of information available, information on drawn pottery was then added to one of two databases. The first of these recorded all available metrical information, MIM diameter, base diameter for open shapes, and also the maximum diameter of closed shapes, as well as general information on the shape and motif of the individual pots. The second database, for shirts that lack diameter information, was a simpler database, recording simply shape and, where appropriate, decoration. Next, 
While accounting for individual authors' typologies, I grouped the pottery in broad typological categories. While certainly the material could be further split, these categories are most useful for the kind of broad brush analysis I seek to, to conduct. We will see some shortly in my case study. Finally, using the University of Brussels volume calculator, I calculated a volumetric measurement on all shirts where I had a suitable drawing, either a complete measure or a measurement of the minimum preserved volume of the vessel in question. As might be imagined, the data collected for this project is immensely rich. Knossos is one of three sites in my wider study, but Knossos alone has yielded information over 3,500 tableware vessels in the main database and 4,500 in total, including those excluded for not yielding metrical information, alongside well over 1,800 calculations of volume. Nonetheless, as is well known, the link between the archaeological record and publications is not straightforward, and all manner of biases affect the information available. So how can we mitigate some of these problems that might affect our data? The most notorious of these, of course, is the practice of discarding supposedly non-diagnostic pottery. Many retained deposits, particularly from Evans's excavations, but as late as the 1980s, comprised little more than a series of decorated rims and bases. <coughs> this, by default, affects our understanding of the non-pattern painted pottery. While this certainly prohibits certain kinds of research, I argue that this problem is not insurmountable. While a truly quantitative study of Knossian deposits is impossible with the state of data at present, a hybrid, low-resolution approach is possible. Discard predominantly affects our understanding of the composition of individual deposits, and not the overall typological range. Moreover, individual ceramic types across all published data, at least the common ones studied here, are unlikely to have entirely gone missing. Therefore, a qualitative, site-wide approach, backed by collecting numerical data from the attributes of the pots themselves, offers us a data set from which we begin pattern-seeking. When confronted with such problems, the main issue is not concluding that no research can happen, but determining what questions we can ask. Combined with discard is the uneven nature of publication at Knossos, and indeed, all archaeological sites, we can divide the Gnossian publications roughly into three types. Full publications with catalogues, illustrations and descriptions, which generally illustrate the full range of pottery with multiple examples. Then we have preliminary publications, which offer a much narrower impression of a deposit to give a first impression. There may be no catalogue, but just drawings or photographs, and the emphasis is on showing the most diagnostic pottery, sometimes to the exclusion of the plain or monochrome types. Finally, there are what I call incidental publications. These do not seek to publish pottery, but incidentally will illustrate a few sherds or draw a few pots in support of a wider point, such as the date of a particular architectural feature. But the problem is much deeper than just variable types of publication. Even our best published deposits are selections of selections. All publication is interpretation, and often the underlying process is unclear. Moreover, the priority for what has been selected is rarely discussed. The point is that, once again, a true context-to-context -context comparison is difficult and perhaps impossible with the current state of data. And once again, the combined qualitative and quantitative low-resolution approach makes more sense, aggregating the available data to produce the largest possible pool of data for analysis. One corollary to this, and the reason I'm not going to speak about closed vessels, is because these tend to be less mendable and thus particularly underrepresented in publication. The final major problem is that of context and stylistic dating. In an ideal world, and by God I wish I had an ideal world tonight, <laughs> in an ideal world this project would be put together from only perfect homogeneous primary context, just as my perfect PowerPoint would be in front of you. However, especially at Knossos, there is a dearth of such context published. As may now be a refrain, my solution is the site-wide resolution. Contextual analysis is certainly a next step in this research, but for now I am trying to establish broad, period-wide, testable patterns. More seriously, in many cases it has been necessary to include stylistically dated material from mixed or secondary contexts. This undoubtedly affects our qualitative and quantitative analyses in different ways. Clearly, individual specialists will and do dispute the dates of individual shirts and pots, 
And it is well known now that Anisocrosaurus, true type fossils, other than my beloved Ephraim goblets, do not really exist. Meaning that sherds can, without context, float between periods. Now, qualitatively, I do not believe this ultimately affects this work. Even if an individual shirt is misdated, because I'm working with an aggregated model, I do not believe, again, that entire ceramic types can be somehow catapulted into the wrong period. And ambiguous cases can be tested against what we might term anchor deposits, which are our better primary and, and uh, homogenous um, deposits. Quantitatively, however, I must confess that the problem cannot be solved. In general, my principle has been to accept the dates of the material as published, unless I have had a very good reason, normally subsequent data having been published since the, the, the case I'm looking at, to redate it. It is almost inevitable, especially in complex periods like MM3B and late Minoan 1A, that some individual shirts have ended up in the wrong period. And moreover, at times I've had to arbitrarily assign ambiguous pots to one period or the other because my data system is not set up to deal with this kind of ambiguity. Usually I do this on the principle of when a type was most common. Nonetheless, I do believe that the problem is perhaps not as grave as some might argue. First, by applying this big data approach and aggregating the material, a few misplaced shirts are unlikely to over, you know, over much affect the overall pattern. And finally, let us be serious. As bad a reputation stylistic dating has among some ceramic experts, we, as a community of expertise, have been studying prehistoric Cretan ceramics over a century. Clearly new evidence can emerge and change things, but the broad contours are extremely well known, and stylistic dating is not as wildly off as is sometimes claimed. It is possible to overstate a problem. Nonetheless, it is a problem, and therefore I include a disclaimer for my work. While I have every confidence in the patterns I have detected in the data set available, I consider my work to be an impression, an impression of a selection, and nothing more. Although I can offer interpretations based on this data, I'm also trying to provide testable hypotheses. My genuine hope is that people might be interested in this work and go away and analyse bulk data or newly excavated pottery that has fewer of the problems I have outlined in order to verify or challenge my arguments. Ultimately, though, I believe that this final disclaimer is in conjunction with my chosen blended approach and that the aggregative, low-resolution, site-wide approach is a viable one to squeeze legacy data. Let's now look at some of my analytical tools. And apologies. Where available, that is to say either from a catalogue or, or a measurable scale drawing, information was recorded on the height, rim diameter, and base diameter. In the case of closed vessels, and the maximum diameter of body sheds was also recorded. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Uh, for analysis, it is generally clear that the rim diameter of open vessels in the prehistoric Cretan repertoire is a reasonable proxy for the overall size of the vessel, while the base is somewhat less reliable. The rim diameter sample that I've collected represents the largest set of quantitative data and the backbone of this part of the project. As we shall see, using averages and ranges, this data can be extremely informative about the role of vessels within an assemblage. Crucially, however, details like rim diameter are inherent and belonging to the artifact. They're not impacted by external features or other statistical approaches which would rely, for instance, on frequency data, which is at the whim of the problems we just outlined. Volumetric data represents the second major quantitative data set gathered for this project. Traditionally, this has been difficult to measure or register due to the fragmentation and delicacy of prehistoric pottery. Using the University of Brussels volume calculator, I have been able to collect well over a thousand measurements of both complete and incomplete vessels, wherever a scale drawing was available. For incomplete vessels, a hypothetic baseline was added to the bottom of the drawing, allowing the calculation of the minimum preserved volume within a hypothetical vessel of those dimensions. The minimum preserved volume is once again, to some extent, dependent on the random nature of the height of broken shirts. However, one advantage at this point is the fact that most prehistoric Cretan open shapes tend to have their maximum capacity towards the rim, meaning that we generally capture a good proportion of this capacity. <laughs> Nonetheless, this random aspect does have some impact on the case study. Volume is a very important feature as it shows the magnitude of difference between pot classes, better than, say, a one centimetre difference in mean 
the mean rim diameter. But obviously, the average volumes generated from the minimum volumes have a degree of randomness. Nonetheless, we have to work within the available data. And in general, even this problematic data supports the data produced by the rim diameters. But one important point to bear in mind when I present average volumes or scatter plots is that most of the data represents a series of minima. That is to say, in some cases, the patterns are undersold and the discrepancies may be larger than seen immediately from the available data. Overall, I have confidence in my volumetric sample, but it is only as one of several toolkits available in, in this sort of shotgun approach to analyzing the data. The second string of the bow are these qualitative variables. The <coughs> qualitative data does not have the same sort of inherent bias that the metrical and volumetric data does. However, the first main qualitative variable is surface treatment, or wear. This was chosen as the basic organizing principle for my data on the basis that it would have been perhaps the most obvious feature to the prehistoric consumer. Pots are divided into plain, no painted decoration, monochrome, all over painted decoration, light decorated, which is the second one down, so dips, spatters, or trickles, uh, and finally pattern painted, as the name suggests. Although it is most likely that combinations of wares were used in actual prehistoric dining, these groups and the analysis of similarity and difference between them are extremely useful heuristics for contemporary analysis. The nature of the archaeological record is such that there are almost no Pompeii contexts. Even our best primary contexts typically represent storage. Thus, I have arbitrarily separated the wear assemblages as the basis for analysis to see whether the groups of pottery produced in each represent the same or different behavioural intents. To be clear, I do not believe that the wear groups map to an inherent social meaning and that certain groups were more prone to using one than the other. Outside of extreme examples such as the late Minoan 1B special palatial tradition of decoration. Decorated pottery, a material often supposed to be associated with the elite, is too ubiquitous in deposits to serve a purely diacritical fashion since everyone had access to it. Rather, my view is that meaning was created by context, a context we have often lost. Social meaning was constructed in the moment, and the combination of pots chosen on an occasion is something we cannot necessarily see. If I am right, however, and wares instead map onto expected user behavior, that's to say a set of demands for a set of pottery, and all had access to all, we still need to account for the discrepancies in the quantity and quality of this material. For example, in Lake Manoa and One Crete, the plain wares were mass produced and by far outstripped the better manufactured decorated pottery, and indeed monochrome and light decorated. Sometimes this has been interpreted as representing quotidian versus expensive, high status versus low status, but in my opinion it rather reflects the consumer demand behind each wear package. Decorated sets were used in more formal occasions, but probably by everyone, and thus the pottery was likely to be more curated and lasted longer, with less therefore consequently being needed, while the plain wear represents a disposable takeaway aspect to Cretan culture. My personal suspicion is that the light decorated and monochrome material, which is often larger and more diverse than the plainware, was the simple day-to-day -day pottery. However, this is hard to track as this group of pottery is particularly affected by the problems of discard and selective publication, being less diagnostic than the de decorated pottery. As in most societies, of course, it is the fanciest etiquette, represented by the decorated pottery, that moves fastest. Critically for my argument, however, they are distinct levels of etiquette and distinct consumption modes. Moving on from where and the joys of post-processionalism, I next created the qualitative period assemblages. These represent a typological synthesis of published types from each period, and slightly left field, I've illustrated this because my pre-existing one got deleted, with um, a Mississippian assemblage from an article by David Halley from about 1983. Um, his work by creating this sort of assemblage is very much what inspired my own approach. So in a way, I suppose that's one benefit to come out of my situation. Uh, anyway, these represent a typological synthesis of the published types from each period. Each type is initially weighted equally, regardless of the number published. The aim is simply to understand the range of ceramics consumed. Nonetheless, careful attention is paid to commentary and excavation reports and statistics where available to understand which of these types are common, and these are the ones that are then selected for subsequent quantitative analysis. These assemblages, therefore, operate as an easy shorthand for diachronic comparison. 
With the material in its period assemblages by where we can begin the intra-period analysis. Pots, again, are functional tools, even if we cannot directly reconstruct the specific function. Nonetheless, they range from functionally undifferentiated to differentiated. This is noted not just through their relative size and volume, but their morphological affordances. We can contrast the top here, the late Minoan one conical cup, and the late Minoan three kylex. The conical cup is undifferentiated, it's mass-produced and simple, with few behavioural signals other than its relatively small size as to what it's for. Indeed, its bland genericity is the biggest behaviour signal. Conversely, the kylex with its stem, foot, pair of handles, inverted rim, shallow body, emits many signals as to <clears throat> an implied expected behaviour. This is not to say that there is only one way of using either pot, but rather, the more morphological variation within a wear group, the more we might be seeing, indirectly, a complex set of underlying rules, manners, and etiquettes for use. My view is that demand leads production, and thus the more differentiated an assemblage, the more consumer demand there is for pots to fulfil specific behavioural roles within a wider package. This variable is particularly good for delineating change over time and the differences between wear groups. The second and final qualitative error, which I see has helpfully popped up by itself, um, is the idea of typological replication and overlap. Put simply, do we see much recurrence in shape between the wares? Clearly all tableware represents eating and drinking, but the manner in which we do so can be shaped by the utensils provided. My view is that the greater the overlap between wares in a given period, the more we could claim there is a consistent and coherent set of dining behaviours appropriate to the use of each set of pottery. To foreshadow what I'm about to argue, we can contrast the late Minoan 3-8 Kylex on the left with its cousins in the monochrome and plain, which are, you know, clearly replicating one, one another. On the other hand, if we look at the top row of the late Minoan 1-A decorated cups, have almost no formal replication with the monochrome and plain versions below, perhaps suggesting a differential set of behaviour. Anyhow, enough theory, because even I've had enough to this point. Let's move to the practical side and apply these concepts to the published Late Minoan 1 pottery from Knast Sos. Let's start with the qualitative analysis of the Late Minoan 1 A pottery to allow us to explore the entire range of ceramics before moving to the more quantitative side of things. This slide, which is a screenshot from my last PowerPoint, um, shows the synthetic period assemblage of open fineware shapes in use, and as far as can be told from published data at Knossos in Late Minoan 1A. Small variants are excluded. Certain patterns, when the material is organised in this manner, immediately start to become clear. So let's go through this slide in the light of the qualitative concepts I just outlined. <coughs> Starting with the idea of type of functional differentiation, if we look to the left, we can see that the late Minoan 1A planeware is extremely generic. Other than the rare one-handled cup right down there at the bottom, the best way of viewing this material is as a set of variations on a theme. The point becomes even more pronounced when we consider the fact that the short conical cup at the top is overwhelmingly the dominant shape within the late Minoan 1A plane repertoire. Given their generally low quality of manufacture, these pots are characterised by their generic nature, small size and inherent multifunctionality, a point reflected in the diverse fine locations across Knossos. <coughs> Moving to the light decorated pottery, we can see that the situation is much the same. The shapes are fairly undifferentiated, other than the one-handled version. Nonetheless, the fact that less of this pottery is recovered should alert us to a potentially different use pattern. A similar point might be made about the monochrome pottery, although we begin to see a little more differentiation with multiple types of one-handled cups and the footed cup. Finally, once we come to the decorated material, we see a dramatic difference. There are more shapes overall, displaying a greater degree of morphological variability in size, shape and attributes, such as functional base types or handles. To be sure, the behaviour signals of this pottery are not dramatic, as they are in other periods of Cretan prehistory, but compared to the other groups on this slide, especially the plain wear, there is, I suggest, a significant functional difference. The shapes are more carefully designed to be distinct from one another and more diverse in terms, and generally more diverse, suggesting a more complicated set of underlying behaviours. 
The idea of difference is further supported when we consider the issue of replication. Across the plain to light decorated range, there is a reasonable degree of replication. We see, for instance, the conical cup in all versions, the small one-handled cup, though these are far more common in the, the light decorators. The implication is that the mode of consumption was relatively similar across using these pots. On the other hand, the decorated repertoire is far more complicated, with this will overlap to the plain and light decorated range. Um, and many shapes simply just don't exist elsewhere. And, and while those that do, such as the handleless cup and the lead rim cup, are themselves very rare as decorated shapes, the implication seems to be that we have a suite of shapes with a more defined function, with the diversity of form being an important aspect of consumer demand. Interestingly, we can see some limited overlap with the monochrome assemblage, the ogival cup, bell cup, and straight-sided cup, all finding analogues within this group. One might argue, then, that the monochrome assemblage operates as a simplified version of whatever the underlying behavioural demands implied by the decorated pottery were. This, um, this, this, final point, uh, this final point leads to a consideration of how we might interpret these qualitative observations. As I stated at the, at the beginning, one of my central arguments is that the plainware served an entirely different, different behavioural consumption mode than the decorated pottery, rather than simply functioning as a cheap version of it. I believe this to be backed up by the characteristics of the various ware groups. The plainware is of small size and low quality. Moreover, the fact that we find so much of it is a reflection more of its disposability than proof of its quotidian status in terms of actual sitting down for meals. Or to be more precise, the fact that it is used a lot and disposed does not by default imply that the other ware groups were being used any less. Rather, it may imply that they were just simply less frequently disposed. They were more curated and maintained as they held perhaps more value for their users. In fact, one could go so far as to say that the high disposal rate of the plain wares compared to the others is solid evidence that consumers had very different consumption modes in mind when they used such vessels. Now, moving on, the quality and characteristics of the light decorated to monochrome pottery, I fear there's a missing slide here, uh, with their added slips and rim bands, uh, likely made them more pleasant to eat and drink out of. Moreover, as we shall soon see, these vessels are also larger and volumetrically more suitable for containing practical portions of food and drink. Finally, what really stands out is just how different the LM1A decorated pottery is from the other ware groups. Although it's today beyond the scope of today's paper, I want to emphasise that this really isn't the case in other periods of Knossian prehistory. In both Middle Minoan 3A and Late Minoan 2, we find significant degrees of overlap between the monochrome and the decorated pottery, and sometimes even the plain wares. This is a particular feature of Late Minoan 1, suggesting that the decorated pottery in this period plays a very different role to its fancy cousins, but also that this is a pattern we can track much more long term. Behaviourally, this diversity of decorated shape, and now we're back with the slide, also stands out since many of them are variations on the basic cup theme. The implication is that the specific roles may be being played by certain vessel types as part of an established etiquette or, or some kind of stable underlying behaviour. We, we can further confirm this when we consider that practically all late Minoan 1A decorated vessels continued directly from the preceding Middle Minoan 3B period, although certain shapes, like the rounded cup, gain a new popularity in Late Minoan 1A. The main difference is one of aesthetic appearance, and we have the motifs illustrated here. The move from a stylistic mixture of light on dark pottery combined with dark on light dominated by the ripple motif to almost entirely dark on light decoration, including continuing ripple. What is striking, however, is just how circumscribed the range of decoration actually is. The, this diagram shows all identified LM1A motifs uh, that Popham identified in 1969, and, and few have been added. But even within this small group, most of them are rare. In reality, probably only four or five of these, which, which should have circles around, but unfortunately don't, um, were common. So the, the ripple top left, the wavy band top center, and then the, the spiral, second left, and then number eight, the reed motif, and number nine, the foliate band. Those, those are, they repeat themselves all the time, and then the rest are, are missing. So this, this hints at a set of otherwise unseen rules and expectations on the part of the Canossian consumers. Not only do the shapes suggest multiple expected functions and divisions, but the extremely repetitive decoration must be the result of a conscious choice, given we know that potters could produce other motifs. 
This all rather implies that if the decorated package was functioning in a diacritical manner, differences within a dining group were created through subtle choice of shape and size, rather than through the overall appearance of vessels, which was carefully restricted to create at least the appearance of similarity and perhaps equality. It should be remembered that Lake Minoan one is considered the height of the Cretan Neapolitia, a period in which many scholars considered to be dominated by corporate horizontal social structures rather than top-down hierarchies. If we move now to the metrical information for this, can we find support for the above arguments? Let's start with the first argument, that there is a sufficient difference between the plain and decorated pottery to suggest that they have different behavioural groups. This first slide, I think, offers some support with the absolute crudest measure, a simple average of rim diameter and volume of all vessels registered in the data set, ordered by where. As can be seen on the left-hand chart, it clearly shows an increasing average rim diameter as one progresses from plain to decorated pottery. A similar pattern is seen in volume, however much more emphatically. Here, we see the true value of volumetrics as an analytical approach, because it emphasizes not just change, but magnitude of change. A 36% increase in rim diameter between the plain and decorated vessels translates into an almost 400% variance in capacity, and really, the, the underlying point that the planeware and the decorated pottery are simply not designed to serve the same function. This point is more compelling when we consider the fact that most published plane vessels are complete conical cups, while the majority of decorated pots in my sample are fragmentary. So this pattern is in fact underselling the difference, and thus the behavioural implications. These graphs also potentially support my suggestion that rather than looking at the mass-produced and disposable planeware as the everyday crockery, of the LM1A Canossian, we should look rather at the less common light decorated and monochrome pottery. However, we cannot take this further today because the samples are so small as to have little direct relevance. So let's move now specifically to the decorated pottery. This chart shows an impression of the relative popularity of the various decorated shapes. Some caution should be taken, and, and I apologize for the general lack of labels. I had to reconstitute these very much at the last minute. But I mean, the, the dominant shape is our rounded cup, but we can see there are multiple other cup shapes that have at least 5% of the assemblage. Now, obviously, this is merely a record of the, the, the published shapes, so there is going to be some kind of bias to this, but I think it confirms the overall sort of qualitative picture of a diverse decorated tableware assemblage. Although the rounded cup is clearly the most popular vessel, this is one of six different open shapes with at least 5%. If we move to the average rim diameters of these shapes, we can also see there is a clear hierarchy with little overlap. For comparison, I included the conical cups to re-emphasize my point about the difference between the plain and decorated vessels. We, we can note that the average rim diameter of, of the planeware is smaller than even the smallest class of decorated pots, the bell cup. However, within just the decorated shapes, there is clear patterning suggesting specific functions for each of the cup types. More nuanced, however, than looking simply at the average is to track these shapes by the range of size they have. My suggestion here is that shapes may have a broader that have a broader range were more likely multifunctional within the assemblage, while those with a more narrow size range had a more specific intended function. By assessing the shapes in conjunction with one another, we might indirectly attempt to build an understanding of how they work with one another within the assemblage. If we look at this this graph, we can see that despite a degree of overlap, uh, each shape class is essentially stepping up from the previous one. Uh, and once again, I've included the, the conical cups at the bottom just to show how sort of distinct they are. The, the point is that no two shapes fully overlap in range, and at the most popular size class, even when their peaks are close, they, they, they're still distinct from one another. So we can see a sort of there is overlap, but the, the classes are still sufficiently discrete from one another, I think that we, we can support the functional argument. Um, this data is perhaps best expressed as a line graph. Here we can see the distinct size popularity peaks of each shape in conjunction with their size range. An interesting point to note is that the slightly increasing ranges of the bell cup, straight cider cup, and the vafio cup, which are, as I propose, three classes of drinking vessels, what stands out is the longer range within the assemblage of the rounded cup and the bowl, that's the, the green and the dark blue. Um, 
While the other shapes will have a clear peak and then tail off sharply, these are more gradually distributed, which I suggest implies a broader functional role. Overall, however, this data supports the notion that the pattern-painted pottery of Late Minoan 1A formed a set of shapes that were manufactured in size classes and ranges with at least some deliberate reference to one another with reasonably specific intended functions. Uh, once again, however, we can use volumetric data to get a sense of the magnitude of differences between the groups of pots. As I emphasized earlier, because of the fragmentation problem, we cannot use the volume as the primary measure for incomplete pottery. However, as a secondary measure to test an existing pattern, we will see that this is very effective. In the following scatter plots, essentially the further to the right on the x-axis a pot is, the higher its minimum preserved volume and higher up on the y, the greater its height and thus preservation. Um, <clears throat> we should therefore be particularly interested in clusters of low height but high volume um, pottery. Unfortunately, as you can see from the first chart, there isn't much we can see here other than the big cluster of conical cups to the left, again emphasizing their, their tiny size. And then it's sort of stretched by the massive sort of three point three litre bowl over there. So let's um, let's go ahead and look at a, a version of this chart which takes that noise that noise out. Here we can see more clearly that I think the data loosely supports the pattern established by diameter. The rounded cup, the green, has by far the widest range on the chart. And looking, and if we look sort of down here at the bottom, we can see that. They are the least preserved, but they're also already demonstrating a much higher volume. And then similarly, if we were to have a circle, which, which has got missing now, unfortunately, in this upper quadrant, um, we would capture most of the, the other cup classes, the, the, the smaller uh, cup classes. Uh, but the best confirmation of this pattern is simply to average them. And um, we can see, again, quite clearly that they, they, they all come out with very little overlap and very nicely distinct. And we have our planeware right by itself down here. Then we have a little cluster here of the three, what I consider to be individual portion cups. The Raffio cup is the, the, the big cup, as it were, and also happens to be the best preserved assemblage. And then we have the rounded cup, which despite its name, I suspect functions as a, as a food bowl. And then we have these, these much larger uh, serving bowls, these, these um, communal bowls and, and and so yeah um i pretty much just said this i mean but this is my view on how and they are not secret shapes they are discrete shapes in the statistical sense but um we have a series of cups that are small to medium for individuals and then we have a series of food bowls but it's it's a package it's a very stable etiquette you know, even if this arrangement that I'm proposing here is incorrect, I remain confident that I have demonstrated there is a stable etiquette in Late Minoan 1A. So it brings us to our final question, how does this change in Late Minoan 1B? And this slide, unfortunately, is not as nice as the period assemblage for LM1A. But as we can see from this slide, the relationship between the wares remains much as it did in LM1A. I, I don't suggest there is any significant change uh, between the relationship of plain and decorated pottery. There is slightly more overlap between the monochrome and decorated pottery, a point I will return to. What is striking, though, is the, on the right, the sudden reduction in the number of open decorated shapes. The straight-sided and vacuo cups have completely disappeared. They only appear in late Minoan 1B deposits as uh, kick-ups or, or heirlooms. And only the bell cup and a jival cup and its variants continue. Similarly, the bowls, the, the in-and-out bowl, uh, becomes rare. And its replacement, the horizontal hand the bowl, uh, is not a particularly popular shape as it's new, it's experimental in this period. Instead, the rounded cup now becomes almost completely dominant within the assemblage. It seems the stable etiquette of Late Minoan 1A has begun to unravel. So if we look at our, our pie chart again, we can see just how much larger a share this has. And, and um, I would say, if anything, this is underestimated because the two segments that's dedicated to the, the bowls um, as I was saying, the, the problem at Knossos is that we only have secondary, we, we, we have a series of possibly late LM1B deposits. So my suspicion is that one bowl goes out of use, there's a gap, and then another one comes into use, but we need more chronological confirmation of, of that. 
So in reality, the, the rounded cup share is probably larger. Uh, concomitant with the decrease in the number and the diversity of the open decorated shape is a vast increase in the decorator variability. If we had 16 at a maximum in LM1A, uh, Sinclair Hood identified, I don't know if I have all of them here, but he says 80 from one deposit in LM1B. So not only do the LM1A motifs continue with more variants, but Leitman LM1B is also adding a whole range of new standard motifs, but a whole extra decorative tradition, the, the special palatial tradition, so that the famous um, Minoan marine and alternate styles, uh, particularly on closed vessels. So we, we simultaneously have a reduced typological diversity matched with an effort to individualize the pots. Clearly in the realm of etiquette and demands underlying decorative pottery, in late Minoan 1B, significant change is occurring. Turning to our quantitative data, let's consider how the now dominant rounded cup has changed. Looking at rim diameter, we can see that compared to the late Minoan 1A version, the cup's most popular size version is now larger. And in fact, on average, my late Minoan 1B cups are 10% larger. We can also see that the late Minoan 1B version has a wider range than the late Minoan 1A, presumably because being much more frequent, it was now fulfilling many more functions. Although the trend to a larger size is interesting, as it suggests perhaps that in formal occasions, larger portions are being served and there's some kind of new dish being served. I, I don't know, I mean, it's something that needs to be thought through perhaps a bit more. Either way, the cup is clearly performing a new role. This can be further seen if we look at the rim diameter distribution. Because of the relative infrequency of any decorated shapes other than the rounded cup in Lake Minoa and 1B, I have amalgamated all the other cups into a single category and both cast as a bowl again into a single category. Again, we can see reasonably discrete groups. Um, so, you know, we have the, uh, and ignore the kind of cups, we're really interested in the grey one, the small cup, and the um, the bowls up at the end. But what's really interesting is this overlap in the middle, and this is what makes me think that we might be missing something here. Um, <clears throat> you know, so if, if we look at this overlap between the cup and the bowl in the 14 centimetre range, uh, given that Lake Minoan 1B represents a moment between the popular uh, middle Minoan and Lake Minoan 1A shape, the in and out bowl, and the increased popularity of the horizontal handled bowl in Lake Minoan 2, we might be seeing here the cup matching a demand for medium-sized bowls, given the relative rarity of the bowl in the assemblage. I in this regard, we, we should regret the fact that unlike other Cretan sites, Knossos has not yet revealed evidence for a multi-phase Lake Minoan 1B sequence, because it would be fascinating to be able to trace the decline of the in and out bowl and the rise of the horizontal handled bowl and, and plot changes in cup size. Sorry, wish fulfillment. Um, if we move to the volumetrics here, uh, we, we can again see uh, quite clearly that the other cups cluster, uh, they're the blue ones, in, in a much smaller size than they had previously, while the rounded cup occupies uh, the, 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 um, the red side, I think, uh, a much wider volumetric range. We, we also see again how it overlaps with the medium-sized bowl. So again, the volumetric pattern, despite the randomness of breakage, strongly supports the diameter pattern. And we can see that the rounded cup had essentially taken on the role of all but the smallest and largest decorated vessels. A point backed perhaps by some aspects of its morphology that sometimes it has a handle, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it has a spout, something that you can see that it has multiple roles. So um, attempting to put together an interpretation of this pattern, uh, one is struck by a sense of in-betweenness. In Lake Minoan 1A, we saw evidence of a long-lived etiquette with a suite of vessels and stable decorative norms. In Lake Minoan 1B, however, um, there really was only one major decorated shape. And, and this is not just a Knossian thing. Uh, I, I was fascinated when I spotted this because I hadn't realised it until I started preparing for this talk. But I, I, I went through the, well, 10-year-old now proceedings of the Lake Minoan 1B chronology conference and this pattern repeats itself at every single site other than East Cretan sites that there are basically only one or two principal decorated, pattern painted, open shapes. Um, so this, this is a broad change in behaviour that is across Crete. 
So if I do hazard an interpretation, my view is that we have evidence here of the seeds of a broader social change. As we know, Lake Minoan 1b sees the collapse of the neopalatial system, and Lake Minoan 2 and its new ceramics, and thus etiquette, are also extremely well known. But could we argue that this assemblage in Lake Minoan 1b, with its repetitive open ships but extremely varied decoration, represents a situation in which consumer demands are more fluid and not settled? That is to say that the, the nature of etiquette itself is up for discussion. The established etiquette of LM1A was no longer in vogue, but a new set of social behaviours had yet to fully coalesce, hence the increased popularity of an already popular and multifunctional vessel type to fill the gaps left by the now redundant vessels. As hindsight tells us, the bowl, the cup, and the goblet, which, which comes in Lehman and 2, form the basis of the subsequent LM2 dining package. Before moving to my conclusions, I want to chase this final point about fluidity in Lake Minoan 1b by highlighting three final qualitative points that emphasize what we might term a new spirit of experimentalism that characterizes the behavior of the period. The first of these is the horizontal handled bowl. As I've mentioned, this is a new shape in Lake Minoan 1b. At sites that have a multi-phase sequence for this period, it appears right at the end. So it's possible that we're looking at late Lake Minoan 1b at Knossos, but we don't have the evidence to support that. But what's fascinating is that on the right, we have the um, canonical version of this from Lake Minoan 2. And on the left, we have what are quite clearly experimental types. Uh, we have, for instance, this overhanging rim instead of the inverted rim uh, that becomes a, that is you know typical of this shape in terms of identifying it in Sherman material. We have this example with horizontal vertical basket handles instead of just horizontal handles. And we have this glorious spouted example. I mean, you, you can see in this experimentalism that they, don't, they have this new shape, but they're still playing with it. They don't know what to do. Is it for pouring? Is it for eating? And then they settle on this form. And this form in Lake Minoan 2 is very standardized. So, so we really are seeing experimentalism. Uh, second, I, I agree with Hood that this piece on the left is not the direct forebear of the LM2 goblet. But not enough attention has been given to this footed cup from the Royal Road. It, and indeed other oddities in the late Minoan 1B assemblage, to me, are symptomatic of an experimentalism trying to find and negotiate a new set of settled socio-cultural behaviours. Third, one of the most striking things in late Minoan 2, on, on the right, is the sudden typological replication in all wares. Complete dining sets were manufactured in plain, monochrome and decorated, with forms that mirror and echo one another, a complete reversal of the pattern I've been talking about in Lake Minoan 1 tonight. Now, the LM1B monochrome assemblage is horrendously badly published. I think I have 20 published vessels, so all of my observations on this are qualitative. But I do wonder if we just have the hints of the same thing beginning. We see this process beginning. Certainly, the plain pottery remains completely unoverlapping, but the monochrome pottery, uh, as far as I can tell from the poor state of publication, may begin to overlap more than it had in Lake Minoan 1a, again hinting at the seeds of a new etiquette and foreshadowing Lake Minoan 2. So, some conclusions. Um, on a general level, I hope, I really hope in the circumstances that I have convinced that we can start to squeeze legacy and published data harder for behavioural information through what we might term a shotgun approach, blending approaches to mitigate deficiencies in our data. In particular, I highlight the importance of volumetrics as an understudied part of ceramic studies. Moreover, I believe that the sort of case study I've discussed today uh, could be applied to almost any set of diachronic archaeological ceramics. Turning to prehistoric Crete in the Neopalatial period, I argued strongly that we should not see plain and decorated pottery as being on a continuum of behaviour. Rather, their variation in differentiation and lack of overlap, combined with the metrical and volumetric differences and the overall variant discard patterns of these wares, suggest completely different sets of consumer demands. Monochrome and light decorated pottery may represent the sort of cheap day-to-day -day China, but the evidence is too slight at present to push this case. Lake Minoan one a decorated ceramics were argued to represent the trace elements of a stable etiquette derived from Middle Minoan 3b, with a typologically diverse set of vessels fulfilling a range of fixed intended functions with limited decorative diacritical behaviour. 
Finally, late Minoan 1b appears in this analysis as a period of transition of the breakdown of one fixed etiquette, late Minoan 1a, and a general sense of unease and uncertainty with regard to the social negotiation of a new set of formal behaviours. Perhaps another aspect of the broader body of scholarship that sees a sense of decline and unease within late Minoan 1b. Finally, close study of the experimentalism of this period, in my opinion, strongly foreshadows aspects of the new behaviours that emerge in late Minoan II, which are traditionally associated with the arrival of Mycenaean Greeks, indicating that whatever social transformative process that led to the LM2 phenomenon, it can arguably be seen to be beginning before the destruction of the neopalatial system. So thank you very much for your attention, and my apologies once again for the lateness and general hassle of things. Thank you very much, Charles, for a very detailed analysis and discussion. Uh, if there are questions and comments, I'll bring over the microphone. Thank you, Charles. This was interesting. I mean, it was interesting and insightful. Let me, a question about volumetrics, and Lord knows I'm a fan of, of volumetric analysis of these. Is it important or is it, is it uh, a factor that people are just not very good at estimating uh, volume of vessels, in, in matter of fact? And how does that affect your view that a lot of this was driven by consumer, cho consumer choice, consumer preferences, and, and um, uh, consumer mm. interest? I, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I agree to, to some extent that people are bad at estimating volume, but this is why I focus on peaks rather than entire range. Um, I, I think there's enough evidence to suggest that, you know, people would be generally aware that a Vafio cup is larger than another class, even if in reality their two cups are similarly overlapping in, in size. Um, and it's this general sense, but I mean, I completely agree with you. I mean, this is pottery being produced in a completely pre-industrial context. Um, I have agonized myself as to what resolution to set my graphs at, that I settled on two centimeters, but I've also made them in one centimeter increments and five centimeter increments, and it changes the path. But I, 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 I yeah, I, I think we shouldn't put too much weight in it, but when we see clear patterns, and sometimes, you know, you get two peaks, for instance, well, that's clearly a big and a small version of something. But I mean, the problem with late Minoan 1 pottery, especially late Minoan 1a, is it's really subtle. I mean, whatever's going on in LM1a, uh, it's, it's very small scale. And this is why I think it's a very fixed etiquette. People just know what their stuff's for. You know, people pull out this thing for this thing and this thing for this thing, and they're very happy with it. And that's why it's interesting when they sort of throw it all away and then they're like, okay, we just want this one cup to do everything. I'll follow up with another capacity question or, or comment. One thing that I have noticed in obviously much later pottery production is that straight-sided vessels are much easier to get to be the same than ones that ha have the same volume as ones that are curved. And I just, it seemed to me that your most utilitarian pots, at least in the early period, had a, a, they, ha they have a kind of sharp, uncurved profile. Mm -hmm. Whereas the more the more the teacup more like like things are rounded and and it's much more difficult in those cases a to get the same capacity because a slight change in the in the curve mm -hmm. will make a huge difference but it's much also much more difficult for other people to tell. So I just yeah, and I, I completely agree. I mean, what's what's potentially interesting and obviously I didn't go in tonight because I was not talking about the previous period, but the one although I although everything in late Minoan 1a derives from middle Minoan 3b. Mm -hmm. One very interesting change is that the most popular decorated cup uh, switches from these cylindrical ones to these rounded ones. So, yeah. I mean, given what you say, there might be something to look into more there. Sure, it'll be fun. Uh, did you try to use uh, the degree of uh, decoration, uh, the 
In other words, the detailed decoration as a parameter to distinguish between the different periods. For example, I noticed that in early Minoan uh, items, uh, the, the eddies were simple. Mm -hmm. Then in late Minoan items, the eddies were more complicated. Uh, um. I have, and uh, this is this is another line of analysis that I, I I'm interested in pursuing. So I have, in in my data set, I've sort of very simply recorded just in account of motifs, and I think you're right that in the later pottery that we looked at today, um, the decoration tends to be more complicated. You tend to find you you can find multiple motifs, but I mean, at the same time, most decorated pots only have one to two motifs it's rare i mean i think the, the most on any pot i have is six um but there, there's certainly and there's, there's a very good body of anthropological scholarship on this tracing design element so there's certainly there's certainly work that could be done there but it's not something i've done yet and another short question uh, in museums you see uh, decorations involving octopi mm -hmm. and fish mm -hmm. uh, you didn't show any of those here. Um, no, um, they they tend to be more on the closed shapes, which I wasn't wasn't so much talking about today. Um, I think I think actually I think octopi are, are confined solely to closed shapes. You get them on on conical writer as well, um, but it's not something you would routinely expect to find on on a, on a small tableware vessel, and that in itself is interesting because. Um, if one were to marry what I was talking about tonight with the closed vessels, Labour Known One B is characterised by an intense diversity of highly decorated closed shapes, and I think this is another aspect of this sort of individualisation that's going on in that period, and possibly a new emphasis on the person hosting and serving. Um, but unfortunately, with this sort of settlement material, closed shapes are really difficult because they're so fragmentary. You know, our best examples are coming from tombs and, and places like that. Thank you. Uh, hello, Charles. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I really enjoyed your paper. So many insights, so many things to think about. Um, uh, it's very interesting. I would like to see, in fact, what you say I would like to read it, you know, because it's so much information, so interesting, really. Um, and you put a lot of emphasis on function, which is very important. I don't know, in, in fact, function in, in equals consumption, essentially. I, this is what I would like to ask you. And um, I would like to see the volumetrics and all, all the work that you do for MM3A and MM3B period, mm -hmm. you know, of course. I know you st you have studied it. Um, in the LM1A, I would like to ask you, because it was very interesting when you were focused for a bit, uh, when you saw this in, in, in a diagram and you focused on the different vessels and uh, you talked a lot about function on this point and you said something about the, the Vafio cup in, in comparison to the other one. Could you a bit repeat that? Uh, each vessel, for example, the conical cup, in aspects of function in comparison to the bell-shaped cup? Mm -hmm. Because you talked about this, you said that the bell-shaped is an individual pot consumption. S S it was a cluster of three, four vessels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I just thought, uh, could you tell us a bit more about it? Of course. Um, if, I, if I shoot back and just pull up what I was looking at. So, I mean, so this, we have the scatter plot here, but what, what I was yes, um, yeah. focusing on was this. So, yeah, this is unfortunately one of those ones where I did have a diagram to sort of explain it, but um, uh, um, I view the Vafio cup as a uh, variant of the straight-sided cup. It's the larger version of it, if that makes sense, because they're, they're nearly always quite a bit larger. But my thought is that... Um, so the, the, the bell cup, the straight-sided cup, and the vafio cup are one-handled individual drinking vessels. I think, you know, one-handle, one-user, and small to large in size. 
The rounded cup is a bit more complicated because it gets sufficiently large that I think it's probably more likely for food. And then that leaves our handleless ojival, you know, little reed cups. And I don't really know what to do with those. I think probably they're just, they're just sort of multifunctional. They, you can eat out of them, you can drink out of them, but they're an individual portion. I mean, their volume's like 180 to 300 mils, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we have quite a nice cluster between the small vessels in this assemblage that are almost certainly designed for liquids. And then we're getting into these larger, more rounded, more ovoid vessels that are, I suspect, more multifunctional in their purpose. I mean, of course, this is, this is getting into the realms of speculation because we can't do this directly, but it's still interesting to see how types group with one another and think possibly about what it means. And at this point, the conical cup does coincide functionally with something else in aspects of volume. Um, what do you think about the conical cup? I, I think that I don't think the conical cup goes with them at all. I mean, its average volume is about 80 milliliters. So the conical cup gets high up because it's they're nearly all complete in this. But if we look at the bell cup, the bell cup's here with an average volume of about 200 milliliters. So the bell cup is on average two times the size of the conical cup in terms of volume. And then this just gets bigger and bigger. So our straight sided cup at about 250, two and a half times the size of the ogival cup, roughly the same. The vafio cup, four times the size. Rounded cup, 4.5 times the size. So, I mean, I really only put the conical cups on this chart to emphasize just, just you know, it's very tempting because we have so many of them to think, oh, they must be eating and drinking out of them all the time. But actually, they're just so small. I, I, I don't really know what they're for. They're more like mezze balls than than <laughs> cups, right? <laughs> I mean, they're not they're not really functional. So these are not individual pots. The conical cups. Think? No. I mean, they're, they're individual, but they're 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 for something different. I mean, there there lots of suggestions, right? Where people have said toasting rituals. Yeah, I think they're just they're like paper cups, right? I mean, they're the water cooler cups. You throw them away and. You don't care if you throw away your conical cup, but you might be upset if somebody throws away your nice bell cup with ripple on it or something. So I, I just think it's it's that it's this disposable versus curation aspect, I suppose. It's what pottery do you keep and what do you discard? And I think that may account for what we see in the archaeological record better than cheap versus expensive and, and things like that. Yes, yes. Thank you. That, that's maybe why it, it, the conical cup specifically this type of cup needs to be compared to the previous periods. Yeah, and they're smaller. I mean, the MM3 ones are bigger. Any more? If not, we can continue the discussion informally over a glass of wine and a sandwich. Let's thank Charles once again. Thank you, Charles. <laughs>